Ed Martell here from the Overhead Athletic Institute. Today we're going to go through another video analysis of an athlete that I've worked with in the past who had a very peculiar throwing motion where he would lower his distal end of his humerus and then push the ball. So he had a, a lateral tricep pain and when we looked at him, he had come to me with some complaints of medial elbow pain, just initially starting to feel it, and he's already uh, recruited to play in college, and looking at his video, we wanted to show some of the things that have been changed. So this is initial presentation, even after I worked with him, I think over a year ago, which is a testament to the fact that, you know, there can be um, residual problems even after you've worked with an athlete, which is why you have to continually correct for biomechanical efficiencies. But what he did here, he's always had, an, had a, a unique signature of taking his arm high, but then he kept it high coming through. But then you can see he's got an artificial supination. So, you know, supination is created as your humerus externally rotates, and then the ball starts facing towards the target. And you can see here he... He does an early artificial supination where there's more supination in his wrist than there is external rotation of his humerus. And then when he comes around, you can see the ball pathway comes out and around, and he's getting to the scapular plane, but the ball pathway, he's still too supinated in that position, and then he comes through, and then he pronates. So, you know, many of the things that happen are a result of what happens initially, because if you alter one tiny aspect of the throw, Early in the kinematic sequence, especially with the ball being lifted, it can drastically alter when you get to maximal external rotation, where the humerus is in relation to the scapular plane, when you're in external rotation, is the distal end going up or down, have you reached maximal external rotation with your thoracic spine rotated more towards the target or further away from the target. So you can see there's where he has a slight pause and then he goes and delivers the ball which changes the EMG sequence of everything. So in that position right there, the infraspinatus is working really hard, the teres is working hard, and then you can see his forward trunk flexion. So very important to understand that when you're altering or modifying someone's throwing motion, it's very important to pay attention to what's happening as they go all the way through the acceleration phase and into the deceleration phase, and then you're, you're modifications need to try and or, or an attempt to try and modify what happens further in the sequence so that he avoids the stress positions that you've identified with your physical evaluation. So now sometimes you have to even use tactile cueing to alter. So in this position what I'll do is I'll have him start from a supinated position to force him to go into pronation as he's approximating his lever arm. And now from here, you can see he's in further pronation and he's further trunk flexion. So now, in order to make this ball go fast, you can see there's a different pathway of the ball. So now he's not circumducting the way that he did in the previous throw. He's more forward flex. He's maintained more left ro or right rotation further into the throw. And now he can deliver the ball using gravity more effectively and his elbows much further in front of the scapular plane as the distal end of his humerus comes down. So the first best aspect is a specific fixed progression where we'll have him throw from a supinated position to go into pronation. I keep on messing up the video, sorry. So now you can see I extend and then he goes through the sequence where he's going into pronation in front of his chest and now he's at a different position further into the throw. He's still a little hyperabducted, but that's just kind of his signature. We're working on that as well in the lift component. But now when he goes into external rotation, you can see the ball's facing a completely different direction. It's closer to his center of rotation. And now from there, as he goes around his rib cage, he avoids the valgus deformation period, so a uh, deformation position, which is everything. So now everything's more in alignment. He's more forward flexed. His lat's being used more effectively. His internal and external obliques are being used more effectively. And because everything's moving on a downward path, he can deliver the ball closer to its target and avoid some of the stress that was placed on his elbow 
in the previous position. So you go into the previous one again, and you can see right here, there's the, there's the valgus deformation right there. And with this athlete, he's not someone who has a ton of external rotation. You know, some athletes are just built with more flexibility. So that's why some athletes can throw relatively incorrectly from an injury perspective and never have injuries. But you have to look at what happens as he does, as he progresses through that acceleration phase, and where would that stress be located. So that quick stop right there in that valgus deformation, without continuation into more rotation towards the target, completely changes what stresses are placed on the shoulder and elbow. So much of what we do is always to try and modify the acceleration aspects of the throwing motion to ingrain that in their nervous system so that when they do go into or when, as we add more components of the throw, they've done this so many times through so many repetitions that doing it in a different way feels awkward. So I've done many things with athletes where I've not even talked about what I'm doing, taking them through some of the apexes of the throw, initiating it from different positions, and then have them try and throw the way that they used to just in one lesson, and there's changes. So the belief that you can't modify someone's mechanics even as they get older, I completely disagree with because I've done it too many times with strategic positioning of the ball that after they work on it over and over again, modifies or alters their kinematic sequence and makes it more efficiently. So just one of the things that we work with, but you know, you can have different presentations, but you have to look at what's happening through that sequence that could potentially distress, which usually dissipates energy. So with Eric, who's already going to be a college pitcher, we want to make sure that he's maximizing what his body's capable of. So the closer you are to a more efficient biomechanical model, the better the chance that you're going to deliver the ball more effectively. Your fine motor control will be used to be accurate, and you won't have to control as many moving parts. You know, we, a lot of athletes who are laterally side bent in the throw or they're moving in an inefficient pathway as they go down the mound, it's harder to have fine motor, fine motor control because your body's doing a bunch of different things at the same time. Your vestibular system, your mechanoreceptors, proprioceptors. So we're very happy with his progress so far. He's only in his fifth visit with us in therapy because we're trying to do things to... Uh, accelerate the, the the healing process with his with his elbow, and with him he had a little weakness in his external rotators, and weakness in his supraspinatus when we tested it in internal rotation with deltoid inhibition. So, you know we're we're in the progress we're in the process of modifying his mechanics. He's very very happy. He's throwing pain free now. He's about 80 percent when he's away from us, which is. The other thing that's always difficult to know when to allow an athlete to go ahead and test the waters and try and throw fully, and that's why it's so important to video yourself and continually progress and use specific fixed progressions to make sure that you're constantly reinforcing the sequence that's going to allow you to avoid those positions that cause injury.